Mike. And thank you. And hello, everyone. And thank you, too, for joining us in another episode of The Better Covenant Revisited, which is our current Bible study that we, uh, which is part of Bible Bases Broken Bread Studies. And this is coming to you through the joint efforts of myself, Ron Bailey of BibleBase.com, and Mike Coles from NewLifeRadio.co.uk. Welcome. This is study 57, so we've covered a good bit of this already. So let's just dive in straight away. This study is entitled just simply Melchizedek. Melchizedek and the Epistle to the Hebrews. As a Bible character, Melchizedek has a somewhat erratic career. He makes his first appearance in three verses in the story of Abraham and then disappears for over a thousand years before reappearing in a single verse in one of David's Psalms. Then he disappears for another thousand years before taking centre stage through four chapters of the book of Hebrews. Why does this mysterious character suddenly become prominent in the book of Hebrews? To discover the answer to that, we shall need to think about the context of Hebrews. So that brings me to my familiar mantra, context, context, context. It would be interesting to know how many times this has been one of my sections in this series, but it's all part of a theme, and that's that if we want to understand the letter, something like Ephesians or Hebrews, if we want to understand that letter, it will really help us if we know who wrote it, uh, who received it, why the person who wrote it to wrote it, what it meant to the person who wrote it, what it meant to the person who read it, and what was the occasion. Lots of these letters in the New Testament, these epistles, are known as occasional letters. I often say this, but it doesn't mean that they happen just irregularly. It's just it's linking with the word occasion. In other words, each one of these has a context or an occasion that was the appropriate time for this letter to be written. They didn't just drop out of heaven in a random way. There were situations, there were contexts which needed some admonition, some advice, some direction, and God inspired these men to write these epistles. So it's good for us when we try to understand the general theme of letters, especially, to try and think a little bit about the context. So, strictly speaking, who wrote it? Well, the epistle to the Hebrews, strictly speaking, is anonymous. Now, different Bible studies now, different Bible students have their strong opinions as to who wrote it, but the only definite answer is we don't know. The recipients of the letter are much easier to identify. They are Jewish Christians who are on the verge of defecting back into Judaism. So, nostalgia versus revelation. We have seen that in spite of the confrontations and epistles and even an interchurch conference, the Judaizers have continued on their mission of trying to make the New Covenant a subdivision, a subset of the Old Covenant. And there was one weapon that threatened to be one of the most powerful of all. Nostalgia. The sights and sounds and smells of Herod's temple must have been emotionally intoxicating. The magnificent building, its gilded roof glistening in the sun, the priests and the high priests in their beautiful vestments, the singing of the choirs, the blowing of ram's horns and silver trumpets, the milling crowds, the sense of scorched flesh and incense, the sense of solemn awe that pervaded the services, Yes, it was impressive. So, how is a house meeting in a house going to compete with this? You see, this is the context. It's easy to forget that all the epistles 
are really written to house churches, where they broke bread from house to house. I was once a part of one of these house churches. No building, no liturgy, no ram's horns or trumpets, no vestments, no fixed services. We used to say that you had to attend all the meetings to find out where the next one was happening and when it was happening. <laughs> there is a delightful Charles Wesley that captures something of this early era of the Christian churches. He writes, Happy the souls that first believed, to Jesus and each other cleaved, joined by the unction from above, in mystic fellowship of love. Meek, simple followers of the Lamb, they lived and spoke and thought the same, break the commemorative bread and drank the spirit of their head. On God they cast their every care, wrestling with God in mighty prayer, they claimed the grace through Jesus given. By prayer they shut and opened heaven. To Jesus they performed their vows, a little church in every house. They joyfully conspired to raise their ceaseless sacrifice of praise. And those are the first four standards, four stanzas of an 18-verse hymn. <laughs> Look it up. It begins, Happy the Souls that First Believed, by Charles Wesley. What Charles Wesley had in mind, of course, was this kind of reference from Acts chapter 2, verses 46. This is on the day of Pentecost and the events that followed it. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, what do I mean by the pull of the temple? Well, the pull of the temple had a strong attraction to all who had experienced it. It always did have. In the days when the nation split into two nations, Jeroboam, king of the house of Israel, knew that the the power of the temple and its worship would be well-nigh irresistible. And of course that was in Jerusalem, in the southern kingdom of Judah. He tried to counter it by creating his own holy sites and sacrifices and even priesthood. It was his attempt to provide a stronger counter-attraction that led him and his people inevitably into idolatry and disaster. First Kings chapter 12, verses 25 following. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and dwelt therein. And he went out from thence and bet, built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now will the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of Jehovah at Jerusalem, then will the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. That's David's son. Actually, it's Solomon's son. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Throughout the centuries, Christendom has continually developed elaborate rituals and magnificent buildings, often loosely based on the patterns of priesthood and the splendor of the old covenant and its temple. I'm not convinced that this was ever God's intention, and it always blurs, in my view, the vision of the saints of eternal realities. In the days when the book of Hebrews was written, there was a clear perception in the mind of the author that many believers with a Jewish background stood again at a point of decision. Would they go on, or would they go back? To make sure there was no possibility of misunderstanding, the writer brings a strong word from the prophecy of Habakkuk. It's quoted in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. 
Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, this is God speaking, my soul has no pleasure in him. But, says the writer of the Hebrews, we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. The writer speaks of the ways that God had spoken in the past and warns them of the danger of neglecting the word of God that has come not through the intermediaries of angels and Moses, but from Christ himself. And in the letter to the epistles, he constantly repeats the refrain, it is better. Christ is better than the angels, better than the prophets, better than Aaron and his priesthood, better than Moses and his covenant and his service for God. The writer declares that Christ has instituted a better covenant, which has better hope and is built on better promises because Christ's sacrifice is better. He is a better mediator. At one point, he trawls through great sections of the Old Testament, drawing attention to kings and leaders and heroes of faith, and ends with the statement, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So the writer's way is to define and describe by way of contrast. Jeremiah, if you remember, I think we quote this almost every session. In Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31, he promises that God is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then the first thing he says about this new covenant is that it is not going to be like the old covenant. So he says... This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah in those days, says the Lord. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I drew them by the hand out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them, says Jehovah. So that's how this trail of the new covenant really begins. And the new covenant is not in addition to but different to, and a replacement for, the old covenant. It is not complementary in the sense of adding something that lacked, but it is a standalone covenant that is perfect in its provision. It is simply the better covenant. That would make a good title for a book, wouldn't it? Yes, I thought so. The priest king. This is where Melchizedek, comes into the story. The author of Hebrews shows that the new covenant is different in kind to the old covenant, and part of the way he does this is by contrasting the Levitical priesthood that was under Aaron originally, the kind of priesthood that Aaron and his sons exercised, contrasting that with a Melchizedek kind of priesthood. In the history of the nation, there had been a clear division of labour between the kings and the priests. The monarchy was provided by the house of David and was descended from Judah, one of Jacob or Israel's sons. The priesthood, on the other hand, was provided by the house of Levi and particularly through the family of Aaron. The priesthood and the crown were thus carefully separated. In Israel's biblical history, there are no priest kings. But in Israel's prehistory, there was such a priest king. Not over Israel, but he was a priest king. A man who held in himself the twin functions of priest and king. But only one such man. And that man's name was Melchizedek. And we read of his Entrance into the biblical record in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18, where it says, and this is how it introduces him, gives us no slow warm up, it just simply says, after a certain event, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of God most high. So he was king of Salem, and he was priest of God most high. Melchizedek appears in the story of Abraham 
without a single introduction. Like a meteorite, he flashes across the scene and is gone, almost before we've had time to notice him. But he provides another of those shadows and patterns, another colour for our palette. Melchizedek is a king priest. Let me talk to you a little bit about Zechariah's perplexing prophecy. Occasionally, prophets bringing the word of God were given messages that must have been quite incomprehensible to them. During the rebuilding of the temple, after the Babylonian return, Zechariah and Haggai encouraged the temple builders with their prophecies. On one occasion, Zechariah brought a perplexing message. This is Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. He brings this message to the people who are rebuilding what's sometimes known as the second temple, or sometimes Zerubbabel's temple. Thus speaks Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Jehovah. Even he shall build the temple of Jehovah, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be, be between them both. I'll read it again, because it's not a very familiar passage for many. Thus speaks Jehovah of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Jehovah, even he shall build the temple of Jehovah, and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. This prophecy was in direct contradiction to all that God had revealed about kings and priests. Kings had thrones. Priests, on the other hand, stood to serve God. No doubt, Zechariah was one of those prophets referred to by Peter, who inquired and searched diligently as to the meaning of his prophecy, and was told that his words belonged to a later time. So what is this prophecy of Zechariah all about? Well, let's begin with this one. Standing room only. In the tabernacle of old, and in the temples that followed, there were no seats for the priests. In fact, there were no seats for anyone. There was only one seat that is usually translated as the mercy seat in our different Bible versions. It was really God's throne in the midst of Israel. God reigned from the midst of the cherubim. And the cherubim were two angelic creatures who looked towards each other and down upon the lid of the propitiatory, or the mercy seat, and there God reigned over his people. Later, kings would have thrones, but priests never. During his explanations to those being tempted to be drawn back into Judaism and the Old Covenant, the writer of the Epistle to the Hebrews refocuses his reader's attention on his main point. This is I think what preachers ought to do more and more. Uh, he just reminds us, he's, he's covered quite a distance, he's done seven chapters, and in the beginning of the eighth chapter, uh, he reminds us what all this is about. And he says, now this is the main point, Hebrews 8 verse 1, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest. Such a high priest, yes, a priest not of the order of Aaron, but a different kind of a priest. It's a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. In Zechariah's prophecy, a priest is found sitting on a throne. This cannot possibly be a Levitical priest. 
It is an entirely different kind of priest. It is a priest like Melchizedek. It is a priest who is also a king. He also makes the point that Levitical priests stood to their wool and that it had to be repeated day after day. In the symbolism of the shadow and pattern, there was no rest for the priests, not even on the Sabbath. Christ, however, is a different kind of priest. He is a priest of the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't mean that there is an order and Melchizedek was one priest and Jesus is another priest in the same order. It's just a way of expressing that Melchizedek's priesthood in the Bible is unique in that he was a priest king. And in that sense, Jesus was the kind of priest that Melchizedek was. He was a priest king. So he makes that point, that Levitical priests stood to their work and that it had to be repeated day after day. And in the symbolism of the shadow and pattern, there was no rest for the priests, not even on the Sabbath. Christ, however, is a different kind of priest. So, standing room only, but also once for all. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 to 13. And every priest, he's referring now to the priests that were functioning in his own day. The book of uh, Hebrews was probably written in the late 60s of the first century, maybe 65 or something like that. That's a significant date because in AD 70, less than five years after the letter to the Hebrews had been written, the old covenant with its temple and its priesthood and its sacrifice passed away and was never restored. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, he's referring to Jesus, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstools. There is the stark difference. The old covenant had standing priests. The new covenant has a sitting priest. He also makes the point that the blood of animal sacrifices could never in its own power take away sins. Sins were remitted, released in the old covenant, but the basis of that remission was never the value of the animal sacrifice, but was based on the value of Christ's sacrifice. In Hebrews 9 and verse 23, the author writes, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of things in the heavens, he refers to the old covenant and all its ritual and all its ceremony, all its glory. Paul refers to it as having been glorious. But the writer of the Hebrews says it was necessary that the copies of things in the heavens. So what Moses saw was a vision and the sacrificial system that developed around that vision was based on something that Moses had seen, you might say, in the spirit or in some heavenly vision of a different kind of worship. And Moses was instructed to build something which was a kind of earthly symbol, a shadow, a picture, a type, something which would give them a sense of the feeling so that when the reality came, when the real tabernacle was up on the earth, they would recognize that this was what God had promised. That's the same truth that Paul describes in his epistle to the saints at Rome. In Romans chapter 3, verses 24 to 25, he says, he speaks of Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. There's a word we could spend some time on. God has set him forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. We've talked about that in the past so I won't tell you my 
story about going through the turnstile at Madame Tussaud's waxworks. Jesus Christ then was the reality of which the temple sacrifices and the ceremonies were symbols and types and figures. Things that gave us the general outline, the shape, the silhouette, templates. But they had no life in them to effect anything in their own right, in their own power. They had no colour in them. They were just, just types and symbols. Why is the writer going to such a length to show that Christ's kind of priest, king priesthood is better than the Levitical priesthood, edited up by Aaron? Well, we'll wait until our next time together on Bible Bases Broken Bread Studies on the Better Covenant Revisited. So until that time, thank you so much for joining us in this Bible study. And God willing, we look forward to your company next week. Same day, same time. And until then, and after that, God bless you.